the number one stakeholder is the student. But after the student, we then have stakeholders that are extremely important as they are their support system. We have the parent, we have the grandparent, guardian or caregiver. We also then have teachers, administrators, and government legislative bodies that, that are also stakeholders in education. And I want to then talk about what I see as the positive impact so far of AI in the education space, and then some thoughts around uh, some of the problems that we're seeing cur uh, currently. So positive impact is the streamlining of administrative tasks for teachers. This is a very obvious, huge benefit that is freeing up teacher time to be able to dedicate to students and be able to totally focus on what their needs are without being having to be dedicated to the massive amounts of paperwork that are there. There is the fact that we today can have differentiated and personalized and autonomous learning taking place, which again, a teacher cannot do with 30 students or 35 students in their classroom. So this is a huge development in the capacity building of the teacher. And then we're also expanding the reach and the access to underserved populations in so many ways through being able to use technology. However, some of the con more concerning impacts are the bias that the training algorithms are creating and some undesirable consequences. So I wanted to just relate one particular story that illustrates this, and obviously there are several out there. Um, this is an example of when it goes wrong and the implications are an individual's future. So essay grading is an example where AI is used for high stakes testing. So comparing student scores from mainland China and African Americans, the grading technology gave students from China with their GRE scores higher scores than the African Americans using the technology. However, when students but, excuse me, when humans were involved in the grading process, the results were reversed. So an experiment by MIT fed two gibberish essays into the system, and both received scores of four out of six, indicating that the essays displayed, quote, competent examination of the argument and conveyed meaning with acceptable clarity. So here is the first sentence from the essay addressing technology's impact on humans' ability to think for themselves. Invention for precincts has not, and presumably never will be, undeniable in the extent to which we inspect the reprover. Complete gibberish means nothing. So how does something like this happen? Turns out that these scoring algorithms don't try to analyze the actual quality of the writing. Instead, they're fed with big collections of human-graded essays. Using this data, the algorithms try to identify patterns that correlate with higher or lower grades. Uh, obviously, we have this kind of feedback, so things get changed, algorithms get tweaked. This is how systems work and, and evolve. However, what happens in a case like this is that particular student with the, in the GRE score that was determined not to be adequate their future is at stake in a situation like that. Very damaging for the individual. Also, we obviously have the problem of training with uh, potentially incomplete data sets, which is going to have the impact of slowing down the learning or hindering it or steering students in the wrong direction. And one of the challenges that I am most concerned with is that having technology be the learning tool, the lack of potential social interaction really compromises students overall and holistic development. And that is a big concern that we really need to take into consideration here. Sorry. So in, in the first slide, I was talking about the student and the student has very, very different faces depending on the circumstances. So student diversity 
includes things like age, ethnicity, language proficiency, fluency, gender, are they disabled, have they learning challenges, cultural background, refugees, immigrants. The students show up in one classroom with all of these uh, attributes and characteristics. On top of that, we have to layer on ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. The data from last year says that one in six adults experience ACEs and a little graphic there, which hopefully you can see of the, the different 10 elements that are considered to be um, ad adverse childhood experiences. So obviously we are, when we're considering the student, we have to consider so many different dimensions of the student as we're thinking about who the student is and how we can deliver solutions for his needs, her needs. So what do I see as the opportunity? I have two uh, aspects that, uh, that I would like us to think about. Um, the first is, for me, the tremendous importance of incorporating and integrating social-emotional learning where possible in everything that we do. Social-emotional learning components like empathy and flexibility, encouraging and modeling collaboration, problem-solving, giving opportunities for students for civic responsibility, and creating learning experiences that build character and identity. This was something that in the schools that I was working in when we were building curriculum and training teachers, this was core to every single lesson that was delivered. And the learning was, it was huge. It, it changed lives in the classroom. So I am such a huge proponent of this aspect of learning that needs to be creatively introduced into everything we do. And then I think the other opportunity is that we really think about personalization maybe in a slightly different way. If we look at the diversity of every student that is in potentially that one classroom of 30, of 30 kids, we really need to think about personalization as what can we do that serves the individual? So not in terms of training sets of data, but what does one unique student need to thrive? So I, I think that is the, the challenge of the future for us. So to, to, to finish up with human agency and oversight. So the big question that we need to answer is, if AI is the solution, what is the problem it's trying to solve? And then we always need to have complete transparency on objectives and the sources of the data that we're using. And every stakeholder needs to understand the why, the what, and the how of, of what they're engaging in in order to be able to choose to participate or not. And we need to build trust from the outset. As new systems are imagined, we need to have the broadest possible stakeholder input and constant repetitive feedback that is informing us as to how well we're meeting the needs of these students. And as we evolve over time, there is no doubt that, this, that everything about student life is evolving and incredibly quickly. And finally, our current education system and social and cultural influences have resulted over time in, in my view, a huge lack of agency for many students. And this is a crisis in missed opportunity and lost potential to fully thrive. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to present my ideas. I love, thank you a lot for your ideas. I will, I will jump in with the question because, because I do have one and it's very much related to your experience in a technology company in the education sector. What do you think, what, what would be the practical advices that you would give to other companies building tools for education? Where should they start to make sure to incorporate all those values that you have, uh, have talked about? How to do it technologically and how to, how to approach this question? I, I think the, the first requirement 
is understanding the audience. Wh who, who are you building for and why? And what is going to be the impact and the outcome of, of what you're building? Um, our ex experience at, at Pocket Confident definitely it has been an interesting one in terms of where is your starting point? You can have an outcome, but you have to have a starting point. So you do a bit of a backwards engineering, but then you discover over time that the way you think that you're progressing is not necessarily correct. So it's constant iteration with feedback and feedback and feedback. I think the most important thing is to be close enough to your audience and your stakeholders that you really understand their needs and their constraints. And, and, and that in the education system is a very, very big one. There are a lot of limitations. Let's probably move on forward. Thank you, Ayla. Do, do we have any other questions to, to Ayla from, from the panelists? If any attendee have, have the questions, please feel free to put them in Slido. There is a, there is a tab there where you can up, uh, where you, you can write down your, your questions and we will address them uh, for sure after the circle of, uh, of little presentations but by every panelist. Now what, what, what I would like to, to ask, I want to ask Yulia to talk about the impact assessment and, uh, and approach to, uh, to impact assessment for technological products uh, and projects. Uh, Yulia, would you share your experience uh, on, on impact assessment? So I'm going to talk first about what Ayla just touched upon is how do we think about the stakeholders in, uh, in the process of product development? And uh, what we find particularly helpful in, uh, in our work is the stakeholder matrix, uh, power and interest uh, matrix, where we look at stakeholders both by the level of how involved they are in the process, how much it's going to affect them. And both, as, on the other hand, we look at how much influence they have on, on our outcomes. Uh, and by power, we mean, we mean not only power in the uh, semantic sense where they can stop us or they can prevent us from doing something, but also the power in the sense that if they're going to be the key actors, the key players in, in, in the product uh, launch or the product user using. So um, here you could see that by these two metrics, we can always categorize our uh, our stakeholders uh, as the ones that are most uh, powerful and the most interested, and they would be our key players. And that's where we need to focus all our resources. So we need to ensure that they are involved throughout the way in the governance and decision-making process, and that we are consulting them every step of, of, of the way and uh, that we are receiving feedback at every moment in time. And in the case, I, I'm just going to use uh, ILS example, in the case of education, that these two groups would probably be the teachers and the students because they are the key actors and they have the most power on how our process is going to span out. And they are also the most interested parties. Uh, then we have... Um, the group that is less interested, but also is equally powerful. So again, let's go back to education. That would be a university or a school administration. Uh, maybe they're not so directly involved in the process, but they can still do something to stop you or to prevent you from achieving your goals. So in that case, you, you really have to think about what are their needs, what are their key concerns, and uh, how you can keep them uh, satisfied uh, whatever you're doing in your, uh, in your product development process. And then, of course, we have uh, groups that are least less powerful, and uh, you would be tempted to fall into the trap into giving them a little bit less consideration. But 
I, I, I would say that this is a bit of a mistake because sometimes you would have groups that are equally interested but less powerful and they can actually uh, you know backfire when they uh, build alliances with uh, your key players or your more powerful but less interested parties so for example going back to education that would be parents for or or funders of of for the education institutions so they are they they can be uh less involved less directly involved but you still have to be considerate of their opinion and you have to make sure that they are informed and consulted and that you can build alliances in their in their faith and the last group is uh, the passive ob observers of the process so you might not choose to spend as many resources on involving them but you still have to be aware of who they are and how they can come on board whenever it's an appropriate time so that's when we talk about the who of impact and risk mapping that's a very simplistic uh, framework but it kind of helps you to put your stakeholders into different buckets and to decide how you're going to align your resources then comes the what of uh, impact assessment and impact definition and uh, I think key uh, trap that we fall in is that we first decide upon the activity and then we decide upon impact and we just kind of get stuck up on what we are going to do without thinking of what the problem is and what the needs are of our key beneficiaries so uh, in our work in the development sector we find this theory of change framework very helpful for avoiding this sort of problem and this sort of mistakes. So how we address uh, planning any sort of policy or social impact program is through this logical framework, if you can call it this way. So uh, before we decide on what we are going to do, we of course define the problem. And then we go to our desired state of our mission or you know, long-term outcome that we want to achieve. And then we, we sort of work backwards thinking about, okay, but what sort of activities can actually bring us there, bringing, keeping in mind the problem that we have. And yes, we also think about shorter term outputs that are sort of the milestone that can bring us to the long, longer term outcome. So when you think about income, you always have to keep into consideration what is your outcome? How do you define your key goal that you're going to achieve with a certain project or program or technology product you're going to develop? And moving from each of these stages of logical framework of activities which bring to certain outputs and to certain outcomes then to the final goal and big objective, you always build upon assumptions you think that this is going to work because a b c d because students like technology because students use mobile phones a lot uh, and you always rely on those assumptions uh, and this is basically the cornerstone of why you think a certain uh, project will bring you to the desi desired outcome and this is where risks really come on board because uh, risks are essentially your way of thinking of why your assumptions may or may not be wrong and why certain activity may or may not bring to a particular output or outcome. And this brings me to the very simplistic but also helpful way to think about risk. So here with, uh, we think from the perspective of two key metrics. Um, of uh, impact and likelihood. So when we talk about impact, we essentially talk about the damage of certain negative activity or negative hazard that comes in, into play and disrupts your whole planning process. So it's, it's essentially the damage that is going to be caused by the risk if it occurs. Then there is likelihood, which is essentially the probability of how likely is something going to happen. 
So when you map one on each other, you can sort of identify the risks which are uh, more dangerous and require urgent action. So that would be the ones that are most highly probable and which would bring the biggest damage. And then you can uh, sort of rank the risks that are less urgent and less uh, dangerous in case of they occur or maybe they're less likely to occur. So you might choose not to spend your resources at this particular moment into trying to mitigate those risks, but it is essentially very important to map them and to know what to expect from them. Uh, once again, this is a very simplistic framework and it has a lot of pitfalls. Main pitfall is that it puts likelihood and impact into the same sort of weighting category saying that the damage of, of the risk is equally important as its probability, which is not the case. You can have something that is highly unlikely, but highly uh, dangerous, and then it will, it will turn out to be a disaster. So uh, when something is a low probability, but high, high impact, you might choose to address it uh, as something that is uh, more serious. So this is, this is just, you know, three very high level bird eye view uh, methods to think about this problem. And uh, uh, I find it quite relevant to whatever sector you go to, be it policy, be it uh, product design. It's just uh, very useful uh, because it helps us to at least map certain problems and certain uh, visions that we have for our products. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Yulia, for, for your presentation. Uh, I, I think that all these three models uh, could be used in risk assessment for technology products, but how would you, uh, how would you advise uh, those people never met uh, one of those models where to start how how should how should we how should we make up our thoughts about using those models first so where should we uh, where should we start applying them yeah again um this is very high level so if you if you're to go into the depths of it so coming back, for example, to the risk matrix, you would need to put numbers on it in order to make a proper assessment. You would need to know a likelihood of something happening and the potential damage. And then for that, you need the data. And for to have the data, uh, you you need to have resources to have this data, right? So uh, this, I find that these three frameworks are simplistic enough for anyone to start applying it right away without drawing on very serious calculations and uh, without having to dig for, for, for data, which is sometimes not easily available. So if you talk about, for example, stakeholder mapping, just uh, if you think about a product, uh, just start out by listing out your, your stakeholders, just like a list. Then draw this two by two matrix and then think about, okay, which ones are the most interested? And then if you think about them uh, as, you just go ahead and rank them by interest and by the way they can impact your process. And then you just put, it, put them in, into buckets. That's as simple as that. And if you talk about theory of change, uh, I guess the starting point would be to, to define your problem like with any design thinking process. You, you just start out by knowing the key points, uh, pain points of your, of your user, of your target audience. And then you think, okay, what would be the ideal state for, for them to have their problem solved? And then you work backwards a thinking of, what would be the, the results that would need to take place for, for this ideal state to become a reality? And you would think about little small milestones which would bring you there. And from there, you, you start questioning what are the best ways to get there? What are the activities? 
and um, so you would think about the product and um, particularly how this product is going to work, how it will go to the market, how it will reach the audience, how it should be best sold and how it should be best communicated uh, to, 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 the, to the users. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. So Simon, I wanted to ask for your uh, for your opinion because we have talked uh, we have talked about the privacy analysis and risks. What is your experience in relation to European Union privacy, uh, not privacy analysis, but policy analysis? Uh, could you share uh, Could you share your your thoughts and thinking about it? your thoughts and, and, and your work? I need to say again just to make sure that I do not represent the institution which I work for, just for it to be clear. Uh, sure, I'm happy to discuss more about the, the, the policy around all this, and especially the policy about uh, risks and risk assessments, because this has been uh, heated discussions, heated arguments uh, in the policy debate, especially with the AI white paper, that the consultation for which was closed recently. Um, so of course, there's a lot of risk about what uh, AI can bring to society in terms of collective and individual impact. Um, and the media tends to, to focus on, on certain kinds of risk, like recruitment or policing. But I'll try to make it more concrete for you and, and actually helpful. Um, maybe one of the core things to begin with is to ask, why does AI matter for policy even? Why, why do regulators focus on this? Uh, and why is it seen as so risky? Um, well, of course, there's all the hype, all, all, all the buzzwords about AI being the, the new solution to everything. And policymakers are very wary about this. So when they make, uh, when they prepare regulation or they, when they think about regulation, they always think about, okay, this thing is said to be risky, uh, but what if we make an AI regulation after and after a few months, everyone will pretend instead of pretending now that everyone uses AI, people will pretend that they don't. That's one of the thoughts that comes by, and that's why you have to realize that it's not AI per se that matters in policy; it's what's behind it, the problems it brings, the specific the the issues and the risks that are specific to AI. The the, it's the dynamic aspect, for example, or its lack of transparency that is very specific to AI, which prevents identifying issues, not just solving them. Um, so the AI white paper, which you probably all know about now, um, has, sorry? Okay. Um, it, it considers risk in, in a, in a very narrow scope. It, it mentions, for example, flaws in the overall design or bias, which are very well-known risks. But the EDPS, uh, as you can see in its opinion on, on, on this topic, uh, has pushed for a more comprehensive uh, view of risks because there's a really great history of risk in, in uh, data protection with the, I think there's someone is unmuted, so I hear something. But, uh, so there's a the working party the article 29 working party which is now the EDPB has has produced material and is discussing what is risk and what is high risk especially and their conception the conception of risk in policy um, has been found to be clashing a bit with the one for the AI white paper um, for example one of the things that is not uh, visible uh, in the AI white paper, which is a very important thing to consider when you consider risks of AI, is that the very act, the very act of delegating a task that was formerly attributed to a, a performed by a human, delegating delegating to a machine like an AI, is uh, brings new risks, and that is uh, pushed. GDPS pushes for this to be more taken into consideration because of the, the, the aspects it brings. So in the white paper, one of the things that drew controversy is the high versus low risk uh, distinction. And everyone saying what should or should not uh, be classified or qualify as, as high risk. Um, the thing is, in the protection law, 
if something is qualified as high risk, there are uh, additional safeguards that are required. But the this is it, additional safeguards. Whereas the AI white paper has a more all or nothing approach that was very heavily uh, criticized. Um, because for the GDPR, every position of critical data is uh, some level of risk. There's no zero risk processing. And there, if there you is go someone, over there is someone on, uh, on the call, so I'm just asking to, me, to mute microphones and to check if everyone's Microsoft muted so that uh, we hear the presenter well. Thank you. Shall I continue? Okay. Um, so basically, all process all processing of personal data is to a certain extent risky, and you can go above that level. Whereas for the white paper, uh, it, the commission initially proposed that either it is not risky and I mean not high risk, and there's no additional safeguards that is to address the issues of AI, or it is, and then we bring. AI specific safeguards. Uh, but this is changing because so many people realize that the not only the criteria used to determine high risk by the white paper as are improper, but also because the distinction is not very really solid to begin with. Um, why this matters is because when something when processing is considered high risk, as you will see, uh, a DPIA is required, so a data protection impact assessment, which is, by the way, not only about data protection impact, but also other fundamental rights impacts. Um, you can, you can, you should, you should, if you want to build a service that uses AI, you should also know that depends depending on where you uh, work, you may be subject to additional requirements. For example, uh, the GDPR says that a data protection uh, authority uh, can say can give a list of uh, processing activities that require a DPIA, and this is the case in the case of in the context of AI um, of Poland and Czech Republic and Italy, Greece, and Austria. So these countries have additional rules on if you use AI, you may have to do a DPIA. So check your national uh, data protection authority. Um, and also know that if you find it too burdensome to do DPIA, you can also group, uh, you can do one DPIA for multiple processing if they are similar enough, even if it's not your processing. If you have a competitor who does the same uh, service as you do, but you, you provide the same service, so it's the same condition, same scope, same context, same goal, um, you can use his own uh, DPIA and save on, uh, on, on money. Um, my slides are not very useful, it's just to keep a, um, a structure. But the next one is, we talked about what is risk and what is uh, high risk. Sorry, can you see this? Yes, so we talk about risk. Can, can you see my presentation, actually? I'm not sure. Yes. Um, no, sorry. Uh, not what I wanted to do. Uh, OK. So this should do it. Um, uh, excuse me a second. And do you see only my presentation right now or something else? Okay, whatever, it doesn't matter. The thing, oh, well, it does matter. Sorry, uh, Nikita, is is it my presentation that you see? Right, or text? right now there is a textual document that is visible on the screen. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I need to keep an eye on my notes, but at the same time, I want to show you things. Um, the thing is, there are official criteria uh, that are used to determine with it, whether something qualifies as high risk or not. Uh, these have been put forward by the the what is now the EDPB, so the Data Protection uh, Board. Um, 
which need to be taken into account. So if you want to provide a service which uses AI and which you fear might um, have severe or important enough impact on people, you should definitely uh, take these uh, criteria into consideration. So, of course, evaluation or scoring, but this includes profiling and predicting uh, aspects about people's life, for example, their uh, whether they qualify for, for work or for a job, um, their economic situation, etc. Um, automated decision making is a very important aspect, and it comes back uh, in the criteria of oops of innovative views uh, or applying technology uh, that is new that can bring new new um, issues on its own. So the thing is, this these criteria were not correctly reflected in the policy debate about the AI white paper, and this is being pushed because it's it's actually the legal guidance given by the authorities. So if I have one advice is if you want to consider whether your service is high risk or not, and whether you need to reform the DPIA, you should consider all these. And they are discussed more in the in the guidance, which I'll link probably at the end. Um, the DPIA itself, uh, only required if it's likely if the processing is likely to result in high risk. And here's uh, something I took from the the same document, which describes the processes and the process of um, of going through the DPIA, considering additional expert input or stakeholder input, and then finally uh, going to the supervisory authority if you think that you didn't manage to uh, um, mitigate or uh, uh, prevent the risks. I'll stop there because I'm speaking for a long time already, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, about this policy development uh, in the chat afterwards. I, I really hope that uh, you would be able to share this presentation with us later on in Discord so that we can come back to it and, and elaborate. Um, based on what you say, said, Simeon, um, there's always a risk uh, that an organization that owns uh, owns a technology, whatever type of technology it is, be it AI or not, not AI, doesn't matter, that uh, it creates an, an even distribution of power. And uh, with an even distribution of power, uh, it's up to regulator uh, or us as a as a as a community who, who wants to to be a democratic community to understand how we want to deal with that power. Do we want to distribute this power or do we want to oligopolize this, this power in the hands of just several players? Um, what, uh, what I'm thinking that could be, it could be interesting to, uh, to see maybe Sally, if you, if you can join into discussion and, and, and explain your, your points of view on, on the subject, because you're working on this, uh, on the exchanges between between countries and, and, and EU and, and China and, and give us a little bit of your your perspective on power and, and matching of different different players in the on the market. Sure, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay perfect. Uh, so it was really a great pleasure to uh, have this discussion uh, with everyone and then due to the past panelists I think people have a very thorough discussion regarding uh, the theories and also different aspects of this AI maybe what I could do is to uh, give people more insights from the practical application of how we use it uh, for the Europe China business matchmaking and investment maybe to give you some overall backgrounds what we do is that um, we try to use the big data text mining and then to uh, try to understand the both markets markets into uh, Europe and also China uh, for the market demands, different participants, and then uh, to use the machine learning as the tool to help us to understand what the market needs, who wants what, and who is good at what, and what exactly is missing. And in the case for the more um, precise matchmaking in between as a bridge to bridge both market opportunities to make sure that people 
find the partners they want to work with and to help the European brands for market entry to China and to help also the Chinese brands who wanted to do distribution to Europe. Uh, maybe I could give you more in-depth understanding. I know it sounds abstract. Maybe I give you more uh, concrete examples then that uh, can pave the way so to understand how it works on the, on the ground. And uh, Nikita, can you maybe show uh, the slides so I can show people how it works and then uh, what it is. So here, here in the um, in the slides, uh, I want to show you what we do uh, with DraftTech Capital and the platform on it. That's the Enter Square. Uh, this is the platform actually core coached by the Swiss Federal Innovation Agency uh, for uh, bridging European companies with uh, the uh, market to China. Uh, and then in in the data, how we set it up because we need to understand who is who. So we set up the database in Europe that covers already more than 3 million uh, SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises who are the hidden champions in their niche markets. And in the meantime, uh, for the Chinese companies, because the ones who are eligible to go uh, international are, are the ones, the bigger players. So that is around uh, 17,000 companies and also the industrial parks and more than 4,000 uh, VC and PE uh, uh, funds. So who are relevant for uh, Europe-China collaboration. So when we have both databases, when you work on the ground, you, you know that all databases are set up in different structure. Uh, for the European database, it covers the German-speaking area, the French-speaking area, and the Italian-speaking area. And then this will be different, totally different labeling compared with what we would have in the China database. In different languages, the one thing, and in different segregation and labeling, and how you call it, and how you cut data, how you define the data, et cetera, et cetera, it is all different. So by understanding both worlds is very important and by using the machine learning tool to help us to do the labeling instead of labor cost one by one to, to mark it out yourself, of which is lengthy and not um, precise in the meantime. So there's a lot of technology involved to understand who is who. And um, when we're doing the matchmaking, when training of the algorithm, so we can do the matchmaking um, by finding uh, what is needed. To have a more concrete example, uh, I give you, for example, um, this is the team. Uh, for example, what we did for the Swiss Business Hub, and that's the Swiss federal agency who wanted to invite the Chinese investment uh, qualified who are who want to set up the European uh, headquarter in China. I'm sorry, who wanted to set up the uh, European headquarter in Switzerland from China. So there are so many Chinese companies and across the whole China continent, this is just too much. It is such a big ocean for them to fish. Therefore, uh, we set up the different criteria to see which companies who are eligible enough to go international, who are having the technology core, uh, who are financially redundant, and then uh, who are already having uh, some business exposure to Europe and who might have likely to set up the headquarters in Switzerland and also who maybe even for the people side will look in detail for example like the senior management who might have some European education or businesses in the sector backgrounds in the sector and sector as different possibilities to understand uh, who are the target group who are interested in coming to Europe then we have uh, like uh, multi criteria to set up the top 250 companies as the high-tech industrial leaders uh, that is relevant for topic this is a very real case to see how the data is used in our data lives and um, how it is being applied to really by understanding in depth of uh, what happens in uh, in Europe and what happens in China and then how we understand both worlds by enhancing uh, the understanding with data, with text mining, with the technology in the ground. I know on a daily basis we talk too much about the technology, the risk, the possibilities in the sector, etc. But uh, when it happens on the ground, it's nothing too much technology to be discussed because it is part of the solution for the users and then for the clients who does not need to dig into all these algorithm, jargon words, and the so far fancy words. They just need to know that we solve the problem with much higher efficiency, much higher effectiveness, and a much better experience. And how is the technology work on the ground? They don't have to know all the tech nitty gritty details. So this is what I understand about the technology. It is part of the solution making people easier, make the life easier for both ends and both worlds. And then without too much techno crack and by too much involved in the technology itself, uh, just my personal view. And then uh, this is how our um, platform looks like. If you go to um, how we mark, uh, how we 
see ourselves, mark ourselves, is a talent and market entry solution provider. So we are using the technology, for example, if you see the map on the upper right corner, that is the map of China, actually, and then uh, we cover more than 400,000 European companies, and also not only European companies, but all foreign investments in China in the past four decades after China's open door policy, who they are, where they come from, where they're located in China, which niche market it is, because there are over 800 niche markets in China, how they're distributed, what's their size, and where is their value chain, etc. These will be all visualized with our map uh, in, in the website. And you can play with the data, you can see how it changes over time, you can see where it evolved along the time when China opened stores, and you can see who is the key players in China, and when you and your company are making a decision of whether I wanted to come to China, and whether it makes sense for me to go, and who are the existing players, and where is my market opportunity sector. You can use that as a tool to help you to make a decision. And all of a thank sudden, you. the data makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Sally, for this introdu introduction to, to this matching work that you're doing. What, what I would like to, uh, to bring back to the table is the question of risk of, of such a system, and maybe other, other panelists would, would uh, give their thoughts on this. What, what do you think? Well, it depends on how you define risks, right? I mean, the, the major risk, I think, lies in people's daily decision making. The risk of the system is mostly people by having the wrong presentation of what it is and then making a wrong decision based on not the facts. So this is the risk where we're using the data to support us with. And then other than that, the data itself is just the raw material. But uh, what you input it and what you get out of it with your interpretation, I think that's key. Uh, this is what I meant by uh, the data text mining, if that explains it itself. Any uh, which area of the thoughts, work? Any other thoughts uh, on the subject, for example, economic inequality? Uh, maybe Tony, do you do you have anything uh, anything on that uh, on that aspect? Me. Uh, th there's only one, I suppose, question um, from from my perspective on for Sally, which is. We know the known known risks, which we're very good at. Um, you're very good at modeling the unknown risk to me. It's a known risk to you. It's how do we deal with the unknown unknown risks? Because that's the uncertainty that we have to look at if we're going to move forward. So where in the risk framework is the unknown unknowns? And my question is, if you have not un full understanding of the known knowns yet, where are we heading and shooting for the unknown unknowns? You know what I meant? I mean, for the data itself, I think the most eligible part for the first step, and which is pragmatic, is to understand what are the known knowns. When the known knowns are not figured out yet, why we are so hungry searching for the unknown unknowns? How, have we already made full usage of what is in the space yet? If so, then that is the best knowledge available for us to control the risk to the maximum we can control. And I'm not thinking that human beings can control our risks. That is on, that is like all under management and everything is safe. I don't think that state status quo would ever happen at all because it's full of uncertainty. Then the thing that doesn't change is change itself. The way of thinking about controlling everything and making it fully certain, uh, I think it is a bit um, kind of, um, I would say it's challenging in a way. Um, so the, the the session was set up, as I understand it from uh, Niktai, is a model of society and democracy and um, thinking about some of the impact. and. You know, we've kind of like gone around some of the education issues. We've gone around some of the identity and and um, consumer data rights issues with GPDR. We've looked at and heard of some of the issues of China uh, and um, also looking at some of the framings um, 
for the ER EBD, which has been for me very useful. Um, I kind of want to talk through this model that's on your screen very briefly as a model of society. Uh, and the reason is, is then to highlight um, some of the questions I've got myself that I'm struggling with. So I'm not going to offer answers, I'm afraid, um, particularly where AI and risks exist in the loop. And I'm going to start off just by talking about power, agency and influence. Um, power, we fairly much know uh, in, in, or in, in terms of we understand what power is, but I, I just want to define it within this particular context as being able to exercise control. And that either can be mind control, physical control, societal control through norms or law. So that's what power is in this context. Um, agency is human agency in this context, which is an actor has the capacity to act. Um, that capacity is act is, is bounded by your responsibilities and accountability. It's, it's bounded by your motivations and, and capacity and your experience and actually your chemistry and nutrition, the food you eat. Influence in this uh, framing is, is the ability of a um, person to determine an outcome. And the, the person's ability to determine an outcome is motivated by incentives. It's also influenced themselves by the skills they bring, which you know help create doubt, forgiveness, guilt, shame, mind games, um, and biases. But influence also comes from the tools that the influencer can use through education, knowledge, facts, and access. So power is the ability to control. Agency is the actor has capacity to act. And influence is the person who helps determine the outcome. Um, you've already raced ahead a million miles in terms of your own thinking and gone. Uh, power rests with government, it rests with companies and rests with individuals. Uh, agency, yeah, that rests with government, with companies and individuals and, and influence, uh, that rests with companies and government and individuals. So this isn't a simple matrix, this is actually quite a complicated one. Um, and they're kind of like trying to embrace them all. And actually they don't really matter. What really matters is these two loops. Uh, because where I come from is I'm really interested in how we make complex judgment in in adaptive systems. And therefore, how do we actually deliver oversight and governance um, and, and, and thought processes within that context? Um, the two loops, one is a constructive loop of how we use power, influence and agency to get better and better and better. The inner loop is a destructive loop how we get worse and worse and worse at the things we're doing and how we don't create a model of democracy and society. Um, the inner loop, just to start off and be quite quick on this, uh, the person with power restricts and controls the person with agency. And the person with agency um, starts to treat with suspicion and, and secrecy and judgment the person with influence because the person with influence is actually creating more rules, more regulations and more law to give the person with power more power, which restricts and controls the person with agency. So the person with agency decides to try and hide um, everything they can away from the person with influence. And it's a continual cycle we see in society where rules are supposed to actually help us, but actually rules don't always help because they actually change our um, psychology to what's going on. Uh, the other outer loop is, is the one of um, these sequences being beneficial and the person with power gives freedom to the person with agency. The person with agency starts um, to believe and give back their agency to the person with power. The person with influence says, let's give rights and education uh, to the people with agency and the person with power therefore gives more freedom to the people with agency and the people with agency have a belief and openness and trust with the people who influence and therefore you end up with more sharing. Now, life is never this simple and they're just really two very simple models to do no more than think around this particular question, which is if one player acts badly, 
the whole loop collapses. So if the person with influence says, rather than giving education rights, I want to selfishly give more rules, uh, more regulation, more law, law, it all collapses. If the person with power, even though they've got education, decides to restrict and control and not do freedom, the whole lot collapses. If the person with agency stops believing and doing the right things and starts treating it with, with suspicion and enforcement, the whole lot collapses. So we know if one player bad, behaves badly, everything collapses to a destructive loop. And all players have to agree to act constructively. And the question we've got with um, even education and EVRD and impact assessment is if we introduce AI into the loop, how do we know it's going to act constructively for the best of all the players and not destructively on the basis of providing more, um, more uh, whatever the, the, the piece is, either power agency or influence, to that particular party. And there where oversight and governance really comes to the fore of how do we protect the interests of one party from actually behaving badly and how do we know an AI, exactly what has already been said about data and bias and so many other aspects, isn't being set up to behave badly but does behave badly because of the data so where does this all become sort of a bit more um relevant uh, so i i blog every day uh, my digital footprint um uh, or a medium and one of the things i've been struggling with in lockdown is um something that's starting to happen which is um, with Zoom calls, even like this call and the go-to meeting calls and everything else, while we share lots of thinking, what we're lacking is community, connectedness or togetherness. And I'm really interested in what a word might be for the fear of losing togetherness. And why I'm interested in the fear of losing togetherness is that AI and data itself is just cold and transactional. And we see this on the high street as retail has lost the time of engagement and has had to become much more efficient and therefore it loses its effectiveness doing the right thing. So we've lost being nice to a customer to the speed of how quickly you can get the money off the customer. Amazon has become convenient and also cold and transactional. So Amazon will win because it's actually more convenient. And if we carry on that route, actually personalization is just a cold transaction. Gamification just becomes a cold direct transaction. Loyalty becomes a cold and transactional. And how do we, have we actually lost togetherness? So in our desire to go towards AI, how do we, how do we as a society protect togetherness as part of this system? And that's the sort of things I'm really interested in, is within all of these contexts, how do we, the humans, do something which is deeply human, which is the effective for us, i.e. doing the right thing for us, which is something we deeply need, which is contact. And actually, COVID-19 has really emphasized for so many people through particularly mental health that's going into breakdown and burnout right now, that we need togetherness. Um, and I suppose it's this struggle within AI. How do we maintain uh, togetherness? That's my thinking. Thank you very much for for this deep deep thoughts on trichotomy in between agency, influence, and power. What you've mentioned, uh, though, that there is uh, there is a way to govern and that this way to govern is through norms slash regulations or, or law. But, but there are other two ways that govern or restrict or allow us to, to, to modulate how things work. It's markets and it's physical boundaries or, or digital boundaries if we create them. Uh, so how do, you think, how do you think this two can, can, can help us in uh, in governing the AI space. 
yeah, you, you, you raise such a desperately interesting question that the way we have always done governance has been on a two-dimensional axis, uh, an XY axis. Um, and totally agree, one has all been about enforcement law and regulation, and the other has all been about um, ethics, promise, brands, best practices and standards. And we know that neither of those are good enough for the future of governance. And there is this huge question of what becomes a Z axis, uh, uh, yeah, a uh, Z axis in the X, Y domain that we've had, which allows us to do governance in a completely different way. And right now we haven't got an answer, but we know that the existing structures and frameworks will not be good enough for what we're trying to achieve. And um, I suppose where we're going is starting to look back into nature to understand how nature starts to look at it, its own regulation itself. And then one of the ones I was looking at today, oddly enough, was E. coli, um, which is obviously the, the bacteria that lives in our gut. And as a bacteria that lives in our gut, it feeds on glucose as a sugar. Uh, and in feeding on sugar, it produces two waste products. And those waste products are um, glycerol and acetate. And what's really interesting is when E. coli starts growing, it just feeds on glucose. But as E. coli produces waste, new E. coli basically adapts and start to use the glycerol and acetate as its food. So quite quickly in a community of E. coli, you don't end up with E. coli that just feeds on glycerol uh, as a sugar, or glucose, sorry, as a sugar. You end up with three types of E. coli, one that feeds on glucose, one that feeds on glycerol, and one that feeds on acetate. And it's that piece that we've moved from what was food to waste, to waste to becoming food. And it's kind of like the same thing we've got to learn, that the environment we were, were in is no use as an environment we are now in and are going towards. So we've got to rethink what is waste from something else as food for us to be able to start creating the new regulation. That might be a bit weird, but kind of like, that sort of sets out some of the framing we're going along. Sorry. Thank you, Tony. So what uh, what I'm proposing to do right now is uh, yes, I'm going to step by step uh, start addressing and, and channeling the questions from uh, from the audience. And uh, right now we also have. Uh, a question that uh, that is popping out, uh, and I'd, I'd be really eager to to hear your your answers. Is how do we trust the machine uh, at the current moment? So on the scale of one to ten, how much do you trust machines? So this these are the answers that we have received so far uh, from from the audience, and. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to come back to uh, to to the questions. Uh, one question that was uh, one question that was asked to Isla is how should we capture that our interruption of intents or words is uh, different? I don't know who who asked uh, the question. So if the if one of the if one of the people who are ask this question is, is present we can uh, i'd like to to know to understand better better the questions uh, or i love would you would you be ready to to comment on this one can you give me the question again yeah the question is how should we capture that our interruption of intent slash words is different I guess this uh, this is related somehow to the work that uh, that we're doing in uh, in Pocket Confident with uh, coaching uh, with uh, artificial intelligence. If if I'm okay, so question correctly, let me let me um, ask you, Nikita, if this framing seems correct, which is 
that the that there is a potential gap between the intention of the words we're using and the meaning of the words that we're using and how how do we then capture the true intent is that is that would that be your understanding of the question yeah that's the, that's the ultimate uh, level of understanding i can get from yeah well oh, i i i think that it it's an excellent question because i think that that shows up in all of our human interactions as well it's what is the the intention or the meaning behind the words that we're using and at this stage in our development we're we're doing everything that we can to contextualize the conversation so we're making meaning from a combination of the words and the context which should reveal the intent and then because of the way we're working we have the opportunity to have the user give us their feedback saying no that's not what i meant at all what i meant was in which case the tech can pick up the point at which we've we've made a disconnect between what the user really intended and and how we've interpreted the intention Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ayla. Uh, one question supposedly addressed to Julia, and I want to ask Julia about this question, is about, uh, is about the risk. Uh, the question is, who decides that something is high risk? Just thinking pandemic was never a qualified risk, and decision making, for, decision -making should be done for whose benefit? Could you elaborate on that, Julia? Yes, essentially when you're making a judgment about risk, and uh, here we talk about first identification of risk, mean, meaning putting them on the list and saying that, yes, this is something that can become a disruption in my operations, and also making a judgment what is a high risk. And um, we, uh, we, we are essentially uh, the ones deciding but the more evidence-based this process is the better it is for everyone and the more robust sort of decision you're going to arrive at so um well i don't want to get into this discussion about how predictable the pandemic situation was it wasn't probably something that was so easily identifiable on the agenda but it's something that is uh, quite usually discussed in all the health and safety sort of uh, uh, settings uh, and uh, it's not something that is completely out of the blue just not to focus on this whole covid situation what you do want to to aim for while deciding on your risks is uh, being based on as much data reliable data as possible so looking at similar situations uh, similar processes, uh, similar settings, similar environments, and seeing what sort of hazards take place in this sort of settings. And then you look at their probabilities and the damage that they're likely to cause. And uh, again, if you want to make a fair judgment on the probability, you, you would want to look at a range of similar settings, similar situations, and see how often it is that this sort of situation takes place. So if we're talking about data uh, leakages, you would want to look at an array of similar organizations and uh, look at how often that takes place with a similar set, a set of security settings, for example. So uh, then that will be your benchmark, your sort of proxy data for the likelihood or the probability. And then you would want to look for uh, what sort of damage the, the sort of situation caused for similar organizations. And if you then put together the two numbers, that can give you an idea of whether this is something that is a high risk or a low risk. I guess that's partially, uh, it's of course a very simplistic way to address it. So, 
I guess the the best um, advice here is to look for as much comparable data as you can. If it derives from your own organization, that's the best case scenario. If not, you look for comparable organizations, comparable situations, comparable products, or even environments. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. So th there is one question coming from Paolo that that I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to try to address. The question uh, sounds, which is the best way to inspect and monitor, as well as to establish limits in order to avoid algorithmic biases and the risk associated with it? Uh, so th there are, uh, the only way so far uh, that we use to deal with biases is uh, dealing through feedback. Unfortunately, we don't have any better any better way for them. What we know where the biases occur uh, in, in uh, autonomous decision-making systems is either they are originated, originating from the training data or they are or originating in the limitations or expansions of the decision space uh, that developers can directly control. Basically, what do we let machines do? This, the second aspect, what do we let machines do, is usually more simple than identifying, uh, than identifying the bias that is uh, inherent in data, because we usually deal with, uh, with very limited data sets for, for training uh, of the machine learning models. For example, in healthcare, uh, we do make decisions based on a subsets of populations who, for whom we, we have uh, performed a di diagnostics and those diagnostics happens at the, at the very specific uh, time range. And because of that, we, we, we see huge biases uh, in, the, in the healthcare industry. And therefore, what the, there, there is an only way for us to deal it is by looking at outliers and seeing how how our historical data doesn't match. Unfortunately, this is a post factum. Uh, this is a solution post factum. And the second one is uh, the forward looking solution is making sure that whatever data our machine was trained on, we use it in exactly the same situation. It's hyper specialization of machine learning applications. Uh, this is one of the, one of the potentials for uh, for bringing uh, robust decisions, where we uh, describe uh, describe models and describe systems the way they are, and then we uh, and then we make sure that only those users who, who are aligned with how these machines were de were designed uh, use them. Basically, uh, bias in this case is okay because it exactly replicates the the story or the profile. Uh, of the user or, or of the user's situation. Uh, I hope I hope I addressed at least partially uh, the question. Uh, and Paula, if you are interested, that the next session is going to be exactly about fairness and coping with with bias, and it's going to happen on the 30th of uh, of July. Uh, there is another uh, there is another question that I want to address uh, to to Tony is. Could the board, so I, I guess this question is about corporate governance, could the board is or should be responsible for governance and decisions for AI? Um, yeah, it, 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 it's an it's a interesting and relevant question. Um, uh, the big issue that is absolutely relevant at boards right now is most boards don't have data skills. And therefore, talking about AI, they kind of like don't understand the very principles by which data is coming and picking up exactly what you just said, Niktara, which is because they don't understand bias, they don't understand the outcome they're being asked to decide on, which is causing all sorts of problematic issues. Uh, a far bigger issue, which is really current for most boards, which they haven't got their, their heads around, is um, the 2006 New Companies Act in the UK, this is very specific to the UK, 
um, which had 1,300 sections, in introduced Rule 172. Rule 172 is director's duties and uh, specifically the reporting of automated decision processes inside organizations. Uh, organizations now have to declare in their public accounts uh, as an audited company, more than 5 million and 100, uh, 100 people in the company, how automated decisions are made and be able to justify how automated decisions are made. And most organizations don't realize how many automated decisions they've got and they don't understand how the processes are set up to make decisions because most of them don't have the data. So it's a great question and it's very current because there isn't an answer. Most directors are running around like headless chickens because they're, um, they have unlimited liability in law. Uh, so so uh, unlike shareholders who have limited liability, directors have unlimited liability um, for all of their personal wealth if somebody can prove they have made decisions which weren't actually the right decisions. So this is really an incredibly topical issue um, and one I, I'm closely watching. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Uh, one, another question I think would be interesting to, to address, perhaps, uh, Simeon, you could, you could tell us if it's correct to say from your opinion that opacity, transparency, and the, the, the risk can be addressed through audit and validation tests. And if, if, this, is, if this is a true assumption, which stakeholders should perform such an audit? Thank you for the question. Um, to answer it, I'll open something. Uh, in a sense, yes, because opaqueness is a choice to a certain extent, uh, but opaqueness still allows for uh, accountability. So you can you can have opaque systems and lack of transparency while still leaving some the, the necessary features transparent. And the thing is, when we spoke when we speak about transparency, we we have to distinguish two different kinds of transparency, transparency for the technician and transparency for the regulator. Uh, the oversight needs dif different kinds of trans transparency than the one who works for the system and who has to build something on top of it, just as much as the regulator, the oversight needs a different kind of transparency than the user. Um, but in a sense, what the regulator, what the oversight wants to focus about is not the technical details um, that are subject to IP law. It's more about how humans behave when they build, when they train, when they test and deploy the algorithms. Um, and this can be audited. But for this to be audited, first it needs it needs to be logged in somewhere and uh, logged somewhere. Sorry. Um, so logging this kind of uh, aspects of the of, of the AI system then makes way for, for auditing and for discovering possible issues. Uh, does that answer the question? Thank you for bringing, uh, thank you for bringing accountability uh, to, to the table, I think. We, what we were looking at right now with, with the regulators is how immutable databases such as blockchain would be the sources of this, uh, the, so, the data sources for the audit for, for machine learning decisions so that we can trace back every single decision and see how this single decision actually links, uh, links to the data on, the, on which it was made. And besides that, uh, on what kind of models and what kind of data labeling was put in place when, when the AI was trained. Uh, I would probably come up with one last question from, from our lists uh, list and uh, we will be, uh, we will be uh, closing our session slowly. Uh, what, uh, what I also 
have is one question for uh, for every attendee is what is the key takeaway from the, from the session it would be interesting to to look at our interactive screen and see uh, who who acquired what kind of takeaway during the session uh, and now what we will do we will go with one of the one of the questions um, The question is, nowadays we talk a lot about agility, technical and business. Do you consider also an agile approach such as iterative, empirical approach to experiment? Um, let, me ask, let me ask this question to, to Ayla because you, you, told about the, you told about the experimenting and, and, and uh, in the development of the machine learning products, could you could you address it? Do could you repeat the question, please? The question is: Nowadays, we talk a lot about agility, technical, and business. Do you consider also an agile approach, such as iterative and vertical approach to experiment, is valid? So, do you think that ethics of the machine could be achieved in in the iterative way, and how do you how do you break down this question? How do you look at this question? I think that um, it, iterate, working in an iterative way is going to be necessary for pretty much anything that we're developing and, the, and that we are, we are doing because the learning can't take place until you have taken a first step and you have evaluated and you have the feedback you need and you've been able to determine has has this step been useful has it done what we said that the the solution was going to do etc so i think the very nature of of innovation in in general terms ha requires an iterative process to it I'm, I'm not sure that I've answered the question, but um. thank you, uh, thank you a lot, Ayla. Uh, I guess we we are going to say thank you to all of the analysts and all of the attendees that were present today. We're we're already over the the plan time. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is I want to invite everyone to uh, our open Discord channel where all panelists will be uh, sharing uh, their useful links and resources. And I want to also invite everyone who is interested in the aspect of bias, uh, bias and anti-discrimination in artificial intelligence to join us on 30th of July uh, on Thursday. The same, uh, the same timing. We're going to, we're going to have uh, analysts from the research uh, area who work on machine learning methods for anti-discriminations, and they will, they will talk about different definitions of fairness and uh, when the bias is okay and when it is not. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it was a great pleasure having you all here in in this conference and uh, I'm looking forward to having you all again uh, in the next ones. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.